Hey, good afternoon. First of all, we noticed that there's a poll for your voting, but try not to vote too early like now. Uh, wait until the session ends and all the presentations have been completed. In this last session, you're going to be hearing from the five finalists in this year's Civil Affairs Issue Paper Submission. They address the topics of CA as a force influence in competition. I'm coming back. The papers this year turned out to be a lot more granular uh, than we've had in the past. Um, in the past, they tend to be fairly theoretical. And for that reason, uh, I'm going to do an introduction of each presenter's paper now, and then we'll hand off the microphone to them as they go through. Uh, the first presentation, we have three Marine Civil Affairs officers, Captain Haviland, and Majors Cook and Newberry, and they discuss how gaps in joint interorganizational and multinational partnerships can be improved and can be closed by CA participation in embassy operations. And by the way, this is a topic that was strongly endorsed by Lieutenant General Hooper in his Monday keynote comments. Uh, second, Master Sergeant Larry Lloyd experienced a gap in civil military relations and provides what I call a wake-up call about gaining a better awareness of adversary and even allied military capabilities. He was in a live situation and experienced the impact of adversarial competition up close and personal, and I'm pretty sure he's going to cover it in his presentation. Next, we have Lieutenant Colonel Diana Parzik and Major Michael Schwilly, and they address a gap in the U.S. response to foreign influence, I, I love the nuance of the name influence, in the informational environment. Then we have Lieutenant Colonel Shafi Sidutton and Robert Schaefer, who are eternal participants. I think they've been competitors in every one of these competitions, and they will address uh, the study on resistance operating concept and how resilience can fill gaps in recognizing who and how competitors are in influencing information operations in irregular warfare. And last but not least, we have Major Zabo and Master Sergeant Nicholson addressing a gap in coordination between U.S. and CIMIC partners. And again, this was a topic Lieutenant General Hooper focused on. If you remember, he was talking about the U.S. well, well diggers waking up one morning and finding them next to uh, NATO well diggers. So that coordination is important. And I have to leave a personal note that this CIMIC presentation is particularly meaningful to me because I looked it up. In 1985, I traveled around Europe to Dutch, German, and Belgian headquarters with an overhead projector and acetate pitch uh, slides introducing the concept of CIMIC, which had been developed by three or four very smart O6s in the 353rd Civil Affairs Command. I tried to find those briefings. They'd be called CIMIC briefings. I don't know, what Major Sabo, when it comes time to you, if you might let me know if that type of historical documentation is available in your world. So let's switch to the participations and you Marines can lead the way. We'll switch the microphones after each speaker finishes. And at the sure. end, you'll be asked to vote and hopefully Chris or someone will come on and explain how that's done. Sure, if I may, uh, and let me just do that now so we don't have to uh, take up people's time later on, if I may, uh, please very car carefully consider these each of these papers because these guys are not only competing um, they're going to be published in the, in the issue papers uh, later this year or early next year. Um, but they're also competing for cash prizes. Uh, $1,000 for, for the best paper, $500 for second place, and $250 for third place. So, um, so you know, it, it's not just uh, for the glory of it. Uh, and then, uh, as uh, General Bingham said, uh, when we're done with all the papers, we will throw up the box for about 10 or 15 minutes while uh, 
we have a presentation uh, from a assistant defense uh, assist, assistant deputy assistant secretary defense. Ah, there we go. Who uh, would like to address um, uh, the civil affairs corps on, on what she's observed? Um, Stephanie Hammond to observe what she's seen over the last few years. Yes, some interesting. That'll that'll be kind of our commercial break uh, while the, the the votes are tallied, and then uh, hoping we'll come back and report the results. I have some other announcements, and then closing remarks by uh, President uh, Okay, Major Cook, take point. Thing. All right, I'm going to share the screen. Well, he gets it up. I think everybody can agree that the Marine Corps is the most under-resourced branch. So if anybody would like to cast their vote to send the cash prize towards the Marines, then uh, we'd be happy to receive it, so. No electioneering inside the poll, Eric, come on. <laughs> you guys have by far the best television commercials. <laughs> it's gotta count for something. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Again, I'm Captain Scott Haviland, and along with Major David Cook and Major Don Newberry, we'd like to present today our issue, which is Into the Gray Zone, Integration of Civil Affairs and Information Operations with Embassies. Next slide, please. Quick agenda, I'll outline a, a brief case study that I think is a good example of a contemporary gray zone. Uh, next, Major Newberry will talk about some an overview of the integration we propose and how to involve the active and reserve component in that. And then uh, finally, Major Cook will bring us home with some multinational effects and some closing remarks. Next slide. Uh, so the case study that we, we chose to kind of apply a gray zone is kind of the Russian asymmetric approach. Um, it's a topic that I think a lot of people are pretty familiar with. It's been in the news a lot, particularly since about 2014. Uh, but the working definition to to all get on the same page with a working definition of a gray zone. A, a good definition that I like here is it's the space between peace and war where state competition morphs into conflict while staying below the threshold of conventional warfare. So the Marine Corps is really good at conventional warfare. We close with and destroy the enemy and we're really good at that but a lot of times we're kind of a blunt instrument and uh, in order to, to operate in this gray zone uh, in, a, in a different kind of way we have to change our approach a little bit. So uh, diving into the Russian case study, if you look in the upper left in that red box, here's a list, certainly not an exhaustive list, but some kind of attributes of uh, the asymmetric approach in gray zones. First, they avoid pitched battle with the West because, quite frankly, they know that they can't win a, a pitched battle. They leverage non-military tools. Uh, you know, we coined the term dime in the U.S., but they really take it to the next level. The example there I have is natural gas, you know, controlling the natural gas exports through the Ukraine and other places, um, leveraging their economic and diplomatic power in creative ways. And they like to confuse and obfuscate. So even when they take military action, such as the, the little green men going into Donbass in 2014, you know, Russian troops with no insignia, unmarked vehicles, pretty evident that they were Russian, but uh, not quite evident enough to launch a, a cohesive response. Um, so the, the ruse didn't, didn't hold up in the long run, but uh, it bought just enough time and space. Uh, next, they like to influence their near abroad. There's a, a large Russian diaspora in a lot of these countries in the Russian periphery. So the, the Baltic states, Belarus, Ukraine, um, you know, ethnic Russians and, and Russian speakers. And they kind of use that diaspora as, as a reason to kind of be involved in these places. Um, and then finally, they obviously like to uh, bolster pro-Russian political groups and parties um, and work against um, kind of pro-Western parties in these places. So um, how do we address these things as a, as a nation and, you know, with our allies and the green box on the right there, you see some, some kind of strategies or guidelines. First of all, don't count on the pitched battle because they're not going to meet us. Uh, they're not going to meet us there. Leverage the non-military tools. So not only military but our diplomatic, economic, and other tools that we have that we can bring to bear. And it's preaching to the choir here a bit with a civil affairs audience, but, um, you know, we have to build strong alliances. We have to, um, 
work not only in a bilateral manner, but in a multilateral setting and beneath the national level to where we're engaging with local populations, local governments, uh, local key leaders. So the uh, kind of enduring or the kind of the output of all this is that how do we do this? How does the Marine Corps do this as a service? Well, the answer is we can't. Um, no single service or no single agency can really do this. So the key is to, to integrate with the embassy team because the embassy team exists and they, you know, they work in all these different areas and they have experts and, you know, on economics and they, they are diplomats and um, they have access to these partner nations. So um, finally, I just draw your attention to the map to the bottom. It's a, a fairly crude representation, but um, I think it conveys the point that, you know, on the left map, you've got the conventional force laydown of the Marine Corps uh around russia's peripheries and then moving to the right if we really leverage our embassy teams our embassy access uh you can see how many more uh points of entry we have both from a geographic standpoint but also an institutional standpoint so i'll turn it over now to major newberry to go into some more depth on that integration and uh, thanks captain Havlin, for the uh, for the intro um so this depiction of our paper actually walks it forward from the integration of IO and CA to our end states of active reserve integration and expeditionary base operations, or EABO. It's a very hot topic right now within the Marine Corps. Um, and what really bridges this gap is the embassy. So Marine Corps civil affairs groups have been extremely successful in supporting operations all around the world. Um, however, our team identified a gap in regards to embassies and gym. So in order for the Marine Corps to close close this gap, a recommend, recommended approach is to really embed civil affairs and I.O. into country teams at embassies. So embassies are really organized at synchronizing joint, interagency, and international partners. In addition, embedding Marine Corps I.O. and C.A. in embassies also further leverages their proximity to gray zones in a way that conventional military forces cannot, just as Captain Havilland mentioned. So I'm going to use an example from the Army. The civil military support elements, or SIMSIs, support host, na host, host national inter internal defense and development strategies through support of American embassies, country teams, and they're usually staffed by active duty forces, right? Uh, the Army also has PSYOP community that's aligned with active duty personnel. Um, and they have the MIST, or the, the military information support teams. So the note of here is SIMSIs and MISTs uh, also include a cadre of reservists and support. So here's kind of where the Marine Corps has a solution. The Marine Corps, in order to operate effectively in gray zones, the Marine Corps needs to really consider incorporating IO and CO, CA into the embassies. So what does it really do? It allows access for carrying out our Commandant's planning guidance, uh, specifically active reserve integration and again EABO. So as it stands today, the Marine Corps doesn't have the CA manpower to provide a robust team to every gray zone embassy in the world. Uh, so in order to provide the, the Marine Corps, we'd offer three, uh, these resources the Marine Corps should seek to staff critical embassies with at least two officers who possess MAGTAP experience, Marine Air Ground and Task Force experience, uh, with an IO and CA background. So this expertise is critical to embassies and poses a challenge for the three reserve CAGs that we have in the Marine Corps who are currently heavily engaged in operations around the world. So to address this gap, the Marine Corps Information Operations Center, or MACIOC as you see on your screen, really needs to educate and better integrate active component IO capabilities with reserve CA units to fill these key embassy billets. MACIOC also has the opportunity to assume, assume a more strategic role by deploying IO Marines with civil affairs teams and other IRCs to country teams. Incorporating reserve CA Marines with MACIOC, IO and CA Marines can receive additional IO training and experience filling these critical billets. So conversely, IO planners with knowledge of CA are then also able to fortify select country teams and the Marine Corps can retain its capability of tactical CA forces while also leveraging a combination of active duty and reserve expertise. So I'm gonna hand it over to Major Cook who's gonna go on to explain the benefits of integration with embassies. So when we were looking at how we, we solve this problem, um, one of the things we were, we were kind of wrestling with is how do we have these you know, operational strategic level effects without having 
you know, senior like geo type representation uh, within the Marine Corps uh, at the CA level. And, and we, we came back that this is really, it's a ready-made solution at the embassies to integrate um, into the gym and, you know, start to have some of these, uh, you know, operational and strategic level effects of, that we'd be looking at. I think, you know, we've all seen civil affairs teams deploy to an area and they don't necessarily have the impacts um, above the tactical level that, that we would hope for. You know, they might do some community relations events. Uh, they may, might look some, some, do some good things that look good on paper, but they don't necessarily um, create effects that, you know, are felt in the, in the years to come. Um, so, and this is also something that we actually uh, talked to a Marine that's in an embassy in Columbia, and that's one of the things that, that he kind of led us on is, you know, we've got civil affairs people here, but they're not really, there's nothing that they're doing that, that's really going to be felt next year. And, you know, we felt that if you put um, civil affairs Marines or um, civil affairs personnel in embassies, then they, they really have to, they're forced in a way to fall into the integrated country strategy because of who they're going to be working for, who they're going to be working with, uh, and so forth. And, and really their focus would be um, area denial and um, anti-access. Um, and then also, you know, either bureaucratic or, or infrastructure uh, or institutional access to infrastructure like uh, ground lines of transportation, uh, airfields, uh, ports, and then potentially even, you know, having effects into the cyber domain um, just by the fact that, that we're physically there and we can, you know, um, we're physically there and we can have these relationships with the key stakeholders in those areas. And like I said, th this takes care of a lot of these, these um, issues of, of Marines not being tasked appropriately or um, to, to have strategic and operational effects. Um, so in closing, uh, for point number one, there we really can't have the, the, the uh, effects that we want unless we're physically in an area. Like there, there's a lot of good things that we can probably do from CONUS, but nothing can replace actually being in those countries, having relationships, uh, and really getting a feel for, for the ins and outs of each specific location. Um, point number two, this really goes into our uh, Commandant's planning guidance of integrating the reserve and active components uh, in the future so that they're working together uh, on a more regular basis. And then secondly, I think this is an incredible uh, talent management tool uh, as far as uh, keeping our best junior, uh, our best officers, staff and COs, NCOs um, in civil affairs in the military because uh, this would be a very desirable tour. I think there'd be a, there'd be a lot of civil affairs Marines that would jump on this and uh, be excited about this opportunity. And, and then the third point is that this is a very simple solution to access. So it, 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 it doesn't require a conventional force uh, like a, you know, a Marine Air Grand Task Force or any, you know, battalion size element to be in the country uh, or even like a security cooperation team, which we as a special purpose MAGTAF have used for access into, into uh, South America, it doesn't require those things, which a lot of times can be complicated either from a um, money standpoint because they're very expensive or they're politi politically sensitive as well. Um, you know, a civil affairs team that's already embedded in an embassy is a lot um, of a softer look as far as um, the optics of that. So to close this up, this is uh, what we feel is a uh, simple solution to a very complex problem. And uh, we appreciate everybody's time and uh, attention. Chris, are we gonna handle questions now or at the end of the, end of the overall session? Sure, that's a good question, and uh, I think what we decided was to continue to roll on, and what I would ask people to do is if they do have a question uh, on the papers, as we did last year, if you remember, we'll do it at the end, uh, uh, time permitting uh, as many of the questions as we can field. So uh, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your, of your screen, and load your question in there and we'll get to them as best as we can after all the presentation. Okay, Master Sergeant Lloyd, you ready? I am. So I'll get my screen to 
area. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, again, my, my name is Master Sergeant Larry Lloyd. I'm with the 415th Civil Affairs Battalion. Um, a big thank you to Brigadier General Bingham for moderating this panel. And it's, it really is an honor to present along so many other highly respected fellow colleagues, many of them I've got to serve with. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Parzik did a lot of great work in uh, East Africa and in Djibouti in 2013 when I was there. And Major Zabo is, is quite the legend in the civic community in Hungary. So it's, I got to work with him quite a bit in 2017. So it's good to see him again too and see that. Um, I really give a big thank you to the Civil Affairs Association. You've really come fully into your own as a learning organization that I know you've inspired you for many years since I joined several years ago. I think the value they bring to all of us in the field is immense and, and growing every year. Um, I thought it might be helpful as we bring the symposium to a close to uh, nest my paper topic with some other comments made during the symposium. Um, Colonel Story two days ago said in, answering a, said in answering of a question made some important comments on the component being willing to, accept, to assume increased risk in influence operations. Uh, Brigadier General Cooley said, we need to have the hard conversations now. We need to embrace outside thinkers and discuss if our lexicon is right and appropriate for influence operations. And uh, Lieutenant General Hopper hit on, Hoover hit on the importance of mapping the friendly network how adding CA components to our Department of State country teams is critical and said that, you know, now we're not building alliances, we're building networks and our networks are only as important as the weakest node within them. And finally, I'd give kudos to Lieutenant Kennedy, who yesterday was the only participant in the symposium I've noticed so far who actually mentioned civil military relations in one of her comments. And I think that's a great example of the minimal role civil military relations plays within the civil affairs community's thoughts and deeds and really is the reason why um, I developed this paper. So let's see if I can get it to go forward here. I'm having a bit of a problem with the full screen, but we'll go with that and make it work. So I think it's important to know um, where a you know, paper's topic came from. And so I've been in the CA community for about 10 years now. Um, I've had it, I kind of go from the infantry, I'm beginning to on-ramp towards having my third CA deployment the first two ones were in Uganda and then Bulgaria and Hungary during Atlantic Resolve in 2017. And my CA experience so far has really been completely within um, the influence operations, even though we weren't calling them that at the time. I'd also say I'm pretty familiar with influence operations. It's really what I do for my day job. I, I am a lobbyist for the freight rail industry. And so my job is to influence various levels of the US government um, on behalf of the industry. And so I also think uh, it's pretty critical then to have an understanding of civil mil what I'm talking about when I say civil military relations. So civil military relations is a social science that works at the intersection of political science, sociology, and history. Um, civil military relations can be called CIVMIL or CMR describes the relationship between civil society as a whole and the military institution that's established to protect it. The majority of the work in the field is directed at studying US CMR um, but it does have a robust comparative political component, and that's largely what I drew up for my paper. Uh, basically, I was interested in how CA can assess the influence of the civil component on a partner or adversary's military institution as a whole. And here I want to emphasize the institution, not merely the operational component. I place this in stark contrast to the traditional CA focus of assessing the impact of US military operations on the civil component. Um, I don't think if, I think if I have to really say, I don't think I really have to say anything too controversial in this, but I do think I've identified what is a pretty significant gap in that we're not talking about CMR and not identifying CMR when we do operations overseas. And if we're talking about influence operations and in competition, that's a critical oversight. So where and how do, is CMR mentioned within joint and army doctrine? Well, it's actually explicitly mentioned twice in joint doctrines, uh, JP 3-57 mentions CMR as basically a third of what is civil military operations, but it really places it as liaison activity, which is not consistent with its academic field of study and really gives us no useful definition. Uh, ATP 3-57, which is civil military engagement, only mentions CMR once, and of course it regulates it to the appendix under reserve forces, and it states that National Guard and Reserve Forces can augment CME operations 
when developing civil military relations. But yet again, it doesn't provide any definitions of what civil military relations are, or in fact, what they should be. If you comb through CMO and CA doctrine for civil military relations intent, not just explicit mentions, you can argue it is found in CA planning products, such as the area study, but it's really not mentioned in much detail and it doesn't really give you any guidance on what to look for. So this lack of civil military relations awareness within civil military operations and CAO does hinder the Army's ability to impact a partner or adversary military beyond its operational elements to get at, to get at what we would call a strategic culture and really a nation's will to win and thereby to be an effective force in the competition phase of armed conflict. CA's references to CMR are a skew of the academic definition and really provide no help to CA practitioners. CA soldiers are supposed to provide civil considerations expertise, but if you look at the definition on the screen there of civil considerations from FM 3-57, the new one, what is missing is, and what is the gap is civil society's influence on the military institution which is a direct avenue for political warfare and competition. So I think it's important to get back to some first principles here. If we agree that war is politics by other means, then what guides military success is political will. Indeed, the joint doctrine note that outlines the comp competition continuum places will as the center of gravity of all three phases. In armed conflict, it says we reduce the adversary's ability and will to the greatest extent possible when resource constraints, when resources are constrained and there's acceptable risk. In the competition phase, it says will, will the competition phase, excuse me, will typically be directed against a strategic competitor that has also resolved to compete below armed conflict, but that the two antagonists will then rarely be equal to their willingness to commit resources and accept, and accept risk. In the cooperation phase, it says relationships developed can have enduring benefits such as increased commitment of a foreign military to the rule of law or greater willingness to support U.S. efforts in a crisis. So that will is dependent on the civilian population's support for the host government and their belief in their military's ability to fight and win its nation's wars. The study of CMR is at the heart of any nation's political will, but especially a democracy's willingness to compete. So the civil component regularly influences the military institution through a variety of methods. And so now we get to the how, how can CMR contribute to civil military relations? Again, as a reminder, civil military relations describes the relationship between civil society as a whole and the military institution. So there is no grand theory of CMR. It generally looks at two distinct elements of the relationship between the state, society, and the military. The dominant study, the dominant element of study is control. And as Americans, we're really familiar with this. It's civilian control of the military, nothing controversial there. But the other element and the really one that really matters for CA is looking at what are, what are variables, which are, can be conditions or policies that encourage or impede the development of a healthy civil military environment. In the CMR field of study, the elements of control and Dr. Berardi's variables, which I drew from, from the book on the screen, what I would call our avenues of influence are directed at a military institution and what, what I, would, I guess I would call a military politics operating environment. So what are those? So what are the CMR avenues of influence? So unfortunately for us, there is no ready-made framework for looking at CMR um, that the Army can readily adapt. Um, I did steal a bit of one from Dr. Berarni and use it in the paper and then contributed a few lessons learned of my own. Um, you can see the list before you and, and CM practitioners should consider these avenues of influence and competition. We should assess the civil component areas that touch the military institution because they're avenues for our foreign competitors to influence what can be our partner nation's um, will to win. So developing a greater understanding of the civil military relations influence on a military institution or what you can call military politics is too vital to be allowed to be left as an implied task in CA activities. Frankly, not all elements of the civil component, Comisi ASCO, hold equal weight. Those that impact the military institution are of utmost importance to CA forces in a time of competition. Current CMO and CAO doctrine leaves the aperture too wide when considering civil considerations and leads to mission creep, or what we heard of as those random acts of kindness. The articulation of a CMR framework within CA activities and analysis is important in focusing the force on what, is, what can be a unique task that no one else, 
outside of academia is even considering or addressing. The Civil Military Operations Doctrine Set 3-57 of both the FM and the JP and our accompanying Army ATPs remain too overly focused on military operations during armed conflict. They do not provide clear guidance on how CMO can be focused on the military institution during the competition phase. And the guidelines of a healthy state of CMR can be utilized to create generalized areas of assessment for CA teams to do downrange. A holistic civil consideration expertise can then be turned into avenues of influence that can become levers of action in competition. The subsequent development and utilization of friendly networks that can influence a nation's CMR will enhance CA's role as a force to win in competition. So building a partner nation's resilience or their will to win is not an engineering problem. It is a matter of politics. If we are to earn the title of warrior diplomats, then CMR is our avenue to do it and emboldening a partner's will to fight. Our adversaries are using CMR as a, as a way to undermine our allies' will to win, as you can see from these examples on the screen. And as important as considering our adversary's state of CMR, it's also equally important to consider our adversary's state of CMR which these two articles, the one from Military Review in the bottom left-hand corner and the new RAND study um, in the upper right-hand corner, which I'll put both of these links in the, in the chat section so you can look at them, do a fantastic job of outlining Russian civil military relations and how the military is using their civil component to influence um, in the competition phase. So in the concluding side here, uh, looking at some uh, .mlpf recommendations and I go in much more detail this in the paper, but for the, the benefit of simplicity here, we need to have a definition of CMR within doctrine that's integrated into doctrine and creates, and is consistent with the academic study, um, and also then creates a framework that can guide CMR assessment, possibly in the form of its own ATP. On the organizational side, I'd echo the comments of Lieutenant General Hopper, Hooper, who, wanted, who said that having a specific CA role, and again, kudos to the Marines for mentioning this in the one before me, at the ODC level is critical. We had that during my, my CA deployment to Hungary in 2017, and we really were then able to map out the, the civil military relations component of Hungarian, Hungarian Defense Forces. Um, this is something we could bring to the table for our Department of State Sisters and Brothers, especially the Pole Mill and Defense Attaché's office, and really bring um, real quality effort to the work they're doing. I'd also mention that there is an association that looks at civil military relations. It's the inner the inter-university seminar on there. Um, and they do have quite a robust comparative political studies area that really looks at civil military relations overseas and would be of great value for the CA community to interact with and build a relationship with. So finally, CA forces and CMO activities focus too much effort on viewing civil society as something separate from the military and not enough time on identifying civil influences on our partner and adversaries military institutions. Partly this is due to the absence of a robust understanding of CMR and our doctrine and guidelines. And integrating the social science of civil military relations could make CA more relevant to our US government partners, provide us with an avenue to develop and identify avenues of influence during competition. Influence operations in competition are basically political warfare and we need CA practitioners to think and act like community organizers focused on our partner and adversary civil military relations. So that concludes my comments and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Stop sharing. Now I'm unmuted. 10 push ups here. 20. Colonel Parzik, Major Swilly, you up? You're muted, Diana. Your, your turn to be on mute. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> First off, thank you for again for nominating our paper um, and for allowing us to participate today. And really looking forward to the questions afterwards. And excited to read the, our, our, the other papers that are going to be put before us. Um, the topic of our presentation is civil considerations in the era of great power competition. And jumping right in, I just wanted to start off um, and provide a little bit of context and background about uh, the information environment. And what we were looking at here with regards to the information environment and, and the challenges that we're currently facing is nothing new. Uh, disinformation 
information has been around for a long time. Um, it's really the volume and information overload, uh, as well as the speed in which in disinformation is being translated on social media platforms. And so if you look at um, the Russia's Operation Infection, which was basically a conspiracy to target the United States back in the 1980s, it took about four years to gain traction. We saw the same sort of response with China and Russia. Uh, China and Russia um, and the, the, the um, in, in the onset of the COVID response this past year and it took a, you know, a matter of days, if not less. Um, the other thing that I think that we need to be mindful of um, is that China and Russia really, they look at the information environment as a means. It's as, as a means to achieve a political end. Um, and really the end state here for them is they want to be the buyer of choice. Um, in a non-democratic world. And what I mean by that is it's not just a matter of disinformation, but it's, it's their digital disinformation um, technologies that they export overseas. Um, it's their, their um, it's censorship platforms. It's the manipulation technologies that they're exporting overseas into like-minded authoritarian regimes. Um, and their intent here <clears throat> is really uh, to, to control populations and in, in, in like -mind, with like-minded allies for themselves. The other thing I think that is important um, is that, you know, it, it's, we're dealing with a much bigger problem in the information environment than just looking at the great power competition problem set here. There's an upwards of about 100 different um, state, states that are currently using online manipulation tactics um, to control not only their own domestic audiences, but have gained sophisticated sophisticated technologies to conduct malign influence operations overseas. And, um, and what I'm re referring to here is, you know, uh, Iran, um, but also Pakistan, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia increasingly are engaged in this online uh, space. The other thing I think that is important for us to um, think about, from particularly from a civil affairs perspective, as we're looking at, you know, our, the future war, which we all know is going to be fought in the cyberspace, and the cognitive space, and the ideological space, and the information space, is is really how the information environment um, translates and manifests itself into the physical domain. Um, you know, we can we can look at the countering our adversary narr narratives um, all day long. But the truth of the fact is that, you know, disinformation travels about six times faster than the, than the truth does. Um, and what I'm talking about in terms of uh, uh, trans, uh, the manifestation of the disinformation environment to the physical space is we can easily point to the 2017 Rohingya genocide in which hate speech was used as a means to incite violence locally. Um, we can look at 2019 in terms of uh, that was dubbed the, the year of the protester. Uh, we can look at the current civil unrest. Um, and it's really uh, our adversaries' approach, and, and they look at uh, particularly democracies as susceptible populations, as, as susceptible, with susceptible um, civil societies um, that they can really target uh, to polarize these, these populations. And how, how this is important and, and the result of what we're seeing is actually um, it is actually really where we should be focused. You know, like I said, it, like I said previously, uh, China and Russia are looking at the information environment as a means, again, to achieve a political end state. And what that end state is, is, um, you know, a non-democratic world um, of reshaping world order in, in their viewpoint. And we are seeing, for the first time in the last two decades, actually a rise in uh, resurgent authoritarianism. There's actually currently now more democracy, or excuse me, more autocracies in the world than the democracies, and increasingly there's more um, there's uh, more indicators globally of this global trend of democratic backsliding of more um, uh, nations globally that are showing indicators of, of, of um, heading in this direction. So, you know, from a civil affairs perspective, why is this important? Well, first off, I, I think um, when we're, look, we're looking at the information environment, um, you know, it's, it's not just a matter of the information environment, but, but we really need to understand what the bigger picture is with regards to democratic backsliding. And as part of the U.S. military, as part of, you know, that civil military relations that we just, we heard just about, you know, uh, our governance structure, military governance structures were also affected and can have consequences in the information environment. So if um, we are faced with challenges in terms of, you know, military sexual harassment and PTSD or strikes on civilians, um, drone strikes on civilians overseas, we'll, we'll um, see consequences in, in again, um, uh, to sow distrust in our military institute. And if this this impacts us and our civil military relations domestically, we have to take in consideration this is going to, we're going to see the same sort of impacts on our partners and our allies overseas. So 
we have three recommendations here today. And the first one I wanted to talk to you about is uh, really changing the narrative within the Department of Defense. I think that from a DOD perspective, we have this tendency to really weaponize the information environment. And what I'm uh, referring to here is Every time I hear um, us talking about dominating uh, in the information environment, I, I have a tendency to, to just cringe a little bit um, because we're not hearing what, what the other voices are saying. And, and if you listen to what human rights activists are currently saying in the information uh, with regards to the information environment, they're talking about things like internet freedom. They're talking about amplify, a, uh, amplifying independent voices. And I think that, you know, we are, we're only, and, and um, the other thing, the other fact is if we're looking at, if we're, if we're weaponizing this information environment, we have a tendency from a DOD perspective to not see the whole, the whole approach, the whole society approach that's really needed um, in terms of the solutions of getting at this problem set. Um, the other thing too, you can look at uh, the countries that are effectively um, are able to counter the disinformation narratives from Russia and, and um, uh, particularly um, Eastern European countries like um, Lithuania and, and, and um, uh, also, like Finland, Scandin Scandinavian countries, um, th the one thing that they'll advocate for is the, really the strong civil society organizations and, and relationships there, um, and the NGOs and and other um, media literacy tools that where they have to push back on on the civil society or on the social media platforms, and are effectively able to um, uh, be able to detect the disinformation uh, when it comes across on social media platforms. Um, so I think I think we really need to look at it from a whole of society approach. And the other thing too is it, it's also uh, it's also actually in our national security strategy of looking at, um, of amplifying local voices as the most compelling voices, as well as um, uh, terminology and language uh, that's in our, our national security strategy with regards to internet inter in internet freedoms. Um, so the next next recommendation that I wanted to t um, touch on is uh, this this whole of government and interagency approach, which you know almost sounds cliche coming from the civil affairs perspective, and. Um, you know, I, we've talked a lot about 3Ds. I think we're all very familiar with 3Ds and as they apply to stabilization. And this is how I've, I've basically looked at the 3D construct um, in, in, with stabilization. We got the little D in the middle, which is USA. We got the middle D there, which is State, State Department. And the D that's kind of like off the page is here is uh, th that's the Department of Defense. Um, but, but if we're looking at the operations in the information environment and our approach to it from a civil affairs perspective, this construct no longer holds true. Um, first off, we have more interagency participants working in this space. We have U the U.S. Agency for uh, Global Media. Um, we have Department of Homeland Security. And not only that, but we also have different offices within the respective agencies that are currently um, leading in this space. For example, global, the Global Engagement Center um, is leading on, on the interagency, uh, in the interagency space for disinformation and um, propaganda. Um, you know, and, and other offices are also organizing themselves and, and and currently standing up uh, uh, offices uh, to view and, and figure out how they're programming against the disinformation space. So the, while we have a lot of institutional knowledge and really understand the interagency value add um, that the interagency can bring, um, a lot of the stakeholders that are in these organizations might not have the same sort of understanding or relationships and, and working in the interagency and working so closely with the Department of Defense. Um, the other thing that um, I wanted to mention here too is we really need to take a look at the lessons learned from a stabilization assistance review and, and consider a similar sort of approach in, in really getting after the interagency space. And the last point I want to make here, and I'd be remiss if I, I didn't mention it, is we really also need to focus on our civil information management platforms. Um, you know, there's a couple uh, interagency platforms that come to mind here, the Protected Internet Exchange and Global en Engagement Center's Insights Quantified Platform. And our value add um, as civil affairs is, is really um, interfacing, having our in insights, on the, on the ground insights and interfacing with the current existing interagency platforms that, that are present. Uh, I don't think from a civil affairs perspective, we give ourselves enough credit uh, that we oftentimes serve as, as the connective tissue in, in the interagency space. And we really need to identify the opportunities and where we can really contribute. Um, and so the next recommendation, I'll turn it over to my colleague here, Mike Schwilly. Great, thanks, Diana. Uh, Technology.
Anyway, sorry, uh, technological difficulties here. But moving, moving on. There we go. So what can we do about this? As Diana mentioned, right? So where does civil affairs fit into this space, right? So um, we've identified five things that we outlined in our paper that civil affairs needs to consider uh, moving forward to more uh, concretely uh, conduct operations in the information environment. So the first thing that we have there is we really need to leverage our strategic advantage in operations in the information environment. That is, we really need to understand that as part of the Department of Defense, as part of the United States government, we already have the strategic advantage over our, our adversaries. We have um, the democratic values and our commitment and advocacy for free and open internet is a strong point. Uh, freedom of speech and human rights and freedom of, of the press. They all give us the, the, the high ground. Um, and this is how we need to frame and think about our understanding for and how to conduct operations in the information environment. Secondly, we need to increase awareness and understanding of uh, the information environment. And there's several ways that we can do that. So one, we need to uh, gain a greater understanding of what our information related capability partners are, are doing in this space. That is the, the public affairs, the psychological operations, the electronic warfare folks, um, our information operations professionals. But we need to broaden the scope um, to include the intelligence professionals. Uh, General Coggins talked earlier uh, this week about developing and testing individual uh, convergence units. Uh, he said that we're going to be uh, conducting some exercises here in the near term. I, I would commend that. Uh, I would commend that. But I would also say that we need to move out further and we need to move out faster. Whereas we need to bring in these capabilities uh, and we need to, uh, to have planning cells at higher echelons. And then at the, the tactical echelons, we need to have action elements that are really bringing together these disparate capabilities into, into one, um, one cell or, or one unit. Um, because the sum of the, the individual capabilities that will be greater when, when you have them together. I would also say I would be remiss if I didn't mention our, our 38 Gulf program that is coming online, specifically the technology and telecommunications um, ASI that, that they're developing. Whereas now we can reach out and we can touch, we can direct commission, uh, directly assess the, the data scientists, the people that really understand the complexities and the nuance of this space. Third, I would say that we need to, to look at the lexicon. We need to work aggressively with both the training and doctrine command, as well as Army Futures Command. There's a lot that's going on in this space right now. Um, just as I was talking about convergence, which is you know a term uh, borrowed from multi-domain operations, the Army's you know capstone or operating concept. We also need to be pressing uh, hard and, and forward on uh, on the doctrine front. I know there's been a lot of discussion recently uh, about uh, updating uh, doctrinal terminology. We need to be, as a community, we need to be part in, of that uh, conversation. We need to be pressing forward on, on using terms such as information advantage and information maneuver. Diana earlier uh, talked about the, the term information dominance. When we're talking about civil rights and we're talking about human rights activists and those that are going to be at the forefront of, of countering disinformation narratives, uh, nobody is really talking about a free and open internet while at the same time using DOD language such as information dominance and information warfare. Fourth, I would say we really need to understand and in integrate the relevant data. So where I just talked about training with other capability areas, which can help to understand and, and explain um, the complexities of the information environment, um, we need to be able to visualize that. And, and while the civil information management is a piece of that, um, and I would applaud the efforts that are going on with, with CAS A, we need to move up further, faster, and, and, and harder in that space. We must be able to, to contribute to the, the common operating picture, and we must be able to provide to uh, maneuver commanders what the civil considerations, uh, what those are, and how those affect the battle space, and how we as civil affairs forces can, uh, can be a key enabler, and at times be the lead element in, in operations. We need to be more engaged in both the competition space as well as the conflict space. So lastly, I'll talk about frameworks, and we have ASCOPE and PMISI up there. But the intellectual frameworks needed um, to, to root the operations in, that we need to conduct moving forward, they're just insufficient for, they're insufficient for, for where we're trying to go today. So this model just no longer serves its purpose. Our, our adversaries have, have moved out and they're doing very complex things, so we need to really um, think hard about you know, the frameworks that we're using and develop some new ones. So 
In conclusion, I would say that in an era of great power competition, civil affairs has increased role to play. And so to do that, we really need to understand the civil aspects of the environment, and we really need to embrace this, compl uh, this complexity. We can't forget the lessons of the last 20 years, but we need to, and we really need to be forward focused. So to stay relevant, civil affairs really must adapt. We need to bring to, uh, we need to bring to bear the, the capabilities that more um, holistically will incorporate civil uh, considerations into into the operations that we're conducting. Thanks for the uh, opportunity to present, and sorry for the technical difficulties. That was fine, Major Shirley. Thanks very much, and Colonel Barzek as well. Uh, Colonel Sadat, and you ready? Ready. Take point. Yeah. It's like I can't share um, my screen just yet. I think until the other one's down. Okay. Go, uh, Chafee. Hey, good afternoon. So um, our paper focused on looking at the operational institutional gaps and how we integrate, train, and validate influence. So um, I'd like to start off with this um, quote from General Cleveland. I think this, this summarized the overall concept very well. We, we lack concepts and, and especially doctrine when it comes to um, influence. If we look at concepts of maneuver warfare, fires, we have very well-developed concepts. We don't have good good conceptualization of influence. And um, this next slide il illustrates it a little bit. You know, what, what is influence? Obviously, we can influence with a TLAM or we can influence with an angry tweet. The question is, we tend to look at influence culturally as, as non-kinetic. And, uh, the, you know, when, when we really look at it from an influence perspective, whether it's lethal or non-lethal, it's just a perspective of weaponeering. It's the question is, what, what, what effect we desire? And uh, the problem that causes for us is if we look at our IO doctrine and we specifically look at information related capabilities. We, we uh, lump together civil affairs, PSYOP, public affairs, and then we have cyber and electromagnetic effects. So by trying to like put all non-lethal together, we've actually, in, we've actually combined linear and non-linear capabilities, which are very dissimilar. And we've combined them into the in a, a single process. So the problem with that is if we try to, to integrate them using that process, the process favors the linear. So if we conceptualize SEMA, it's more like fires, and it fits better into the joint targeting process. So, you know, we always look at how, it, how difficult it is to get influence into joint targeting, and that's one of, one of the reasons. We, um, you know, joint targeting is, is very, very much focused on the air tasking order cycle. And obviously, we don't plan civil affairs engagement based on an ATO cycle. So we're at a disadvantage when it comes to, uh, to planning and integrating. You know, another aspect is the concept of key leader engagements. We have that doctrinally key leader engagement, but we do not distinguish between purely tactical engagements and tactical engagements that have strategic effects. So just to use a couple of historic examples, we have T. Lawrence, we have Edward Lansdale. You know, these type of engagements are more similar to the engagements that civil affairs, PSYOP, SF, foreign area officers, SFABs, security cooperation officers, that these are the types of engagements we do, you know, at various levels. And, you know, if we wanted to characterize these, it would be enduring engagements versus episodic. It requires select attributes on the part of the engager. It uh, requires regional and cultural training. And it, it allows for the two-way exchange of narratives. You know, and, and that's the part that actually makes it strategic. When we look at narratives, will to fight, legitimacy of governance. You know, if we look at the lessons of the last 20 years, you know, we can have tactical success with training and equipping a partner force. If they lack the will to fight, or the government that they're uh, fighting for lacks legitimacy with the population, we end up with strategic failure. So that's why you know, it's a gap within our, our um, IO doctrine is not being able to articulate strategic engagement. So we take that and then we want to look at how, how do we train and validate strategic engagement. So we use the resistance operating concept as our case study. So the ROC, it's a um, 
It's an effort to study resilience. It's a partnership between SOC here and our European partners. The basic premise for it is you have a small partner nation, um, very small military. They are surrounded essentially by a larger aggressive uh, um, adversary and that, that they could not, they hold no hope of being able to fight them conventionally. So they're basing their national defense concept on the premise that if they're invaded, they're going to be rolled up, they're going to be overrun, and will, they will be occupied. So the idea is how to maintain continuity of their government, continuity of their society, you know, to resist the occupier and hold out and help a, um, any allied power that is um, working to dislodge the occupier. So they're framing their national defense in terms of resistance. So essentially that means taking their government and being able to transition to a shadow government, being able to uh, develop resistance networks that they can activate once they're occupied. So the importance for civil affairs with this is the prerequisite to resistance is resilience. So if there's civil vulnerabilities in their systems, in their systems of governance, in you know, in, in any of the services provided by the government, if, if uh, vulnerabilities exist, those are going to be magnified during an occupation. That inhibits their ability to transition those to a clandestine shadow government. It inhibits their ability to, to raise an effective resistance. And it also, we look at things like um, national identity, will, and, and those kind of narratives. Those are, uh, those are a very important part of it, too. So we look at what we do during competition, strategic engagement. So a SIMC working out of the country, you know, multiple rotations, engaging with civil networks, this is building resilience. We're identifying vulnerabilities within their society, within their civil systems, within their civil uh, um, structures. And the point for us is, is when we train strategic influence, we ha we've had a longstanding difficulty in training strategic influence. You know, we look at in st strategic engagement. You know, if you look at the issues we have with stabilization, so when we try to put stabilization in a joint force exercise, you know, it, it may be a priority, but it, it, it's usually not the maneuver commander's priority during the beginning or the middle of an exercise. So it gets pushed to the end. Now, a lot of times it becomes an afterthought. A lot of the times it doesn't really integrate well into the exercise. So the key component here is if we're doing an exercise that involves a theater with a partner nation that is using resistance as, a, as its national defense concept, this has to come up front, that we're looking at, at them is that they, they will be conducting an act of resistance. And the effectiveness of their resistance will affect how we participate in, in helping to liberate them. So for example, if, if, a, um, if you have a country with a partner nation with an effective resistance, it goes to large scale combat operations, that resistance will be feeding the targeting process from the new commander. They'll be conducting subversion, uh, sabotage, and these things will provide a measurable effect for the conventional force that is, that is operating. And um, the level of that resistance, it, it basically means how much we have to do unilaterally and versus how much their partner force is a force multiplier for us. So what we've done, is, you know, a concept like this would take the idea of resistance, put it up at the front of, uh, of an exercise. And because resilience is the foundation of resistance, it, we, we have to look at it from the point, if you don't build resi resilience into the plan, you're not gonna have an effective resistance and you're gonna have measurable effects that are, that are going to go badly. So, you know, the resistance operating concept also has measures for assessing resilience. There's a um, foreign malign influence chart and a methodology. So you could, you could conceivably create two part exercises or you could run a unconventional warfare exercise prior to a joint chiefs of staff exercise. And that would feed that, that exercise and highlight to joint force maneuver commanders the importance of resilience. Um, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Rob, who's gonna talk a little bit more from the institutional and the doctrinal side. Hey, uh, thanks, Shaf. So Shafi presented the up and out operational challenges. Uh, now I want to present the down and in institutional challenges that affect civil affairs and competition. And competition, the way the Army looks at it, you know, it's a reality. Um, it's relevant to the Combined Arms Center and therefore it's relevant to my organization, the Center for Army Lessons Learned. Because even at that lowest level, what is competition? That's something that we're struggling to define. And so, 
The theory of strategic enduring engagements uh, as a civil affairs mechanism for influences, as we've already discussed, it's a twofold gap. Uh, the operational execution and the institutional hubris against the need to adapt and modernize. The latter to which I now speak, uh, it prevents the modern force to move forward with updated doctrine and the tools necessary to perform strategic engagements and excel with influence as an information related capability. The IRCs we're always hearing about or reading about. Uh, the problem within the institutional layer is also twofold in that the joint and army staff structure and the lack of relevant doctrine that speaks to the need for civil affairs to influence in the competitive environment. I'll say that again, in the competitive environment. So civil affairs and civil military operations collectively, it's not a joint function by doctrine and exists only at some echelons in the army above brigade level as a G9 directorate, as we know. And this is mostly due from the cultural influences in the past where staff planners knowledgeable in humanitarian assistance and disaster relief were assigned. Yet, <laughs> and the irony should not be lost on any of us that when you look at both USASAC and First Special Forces Command, the G9s, they're not CMO directorates. Um, but broadly speaking, and at both the joint and army levels, you know, we must move away from the false dichotomy of conflict and stability and must embrace the emergent language of cooperation, competition, and of course, conflict, or what the joint force uh, now wants to call the uh, competition continuum. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you want more information on the competition continuum, uh, please refer to Joint Doctrine Note 1-19. Uh, uh, I've heard at least twice, uh, the need to fix the lexicon. And I believe if you know, we start looking at some of the, uh, the recent literature that's coming out from the joint force, we can get a better idea of how that we should go up and out and conceptualize how we want to uh, um, compete. And so thus, if, uh, if, if civil affairs is to in, uh, influence integrated campaigning, as, as recent uh, joint literature suggests, uh, CA will need to align itself within the supported maneuver commander's priorities. And these priorities more often than not fall within the six army warfighting functions. And that means that civil affairs must embrace becoming embedded with other staff directorates that support these functions, such as within the J2 or G2, where human network analysis or SIM must reside, because that's where you're going to develop and update your running staff estimates on uh, civil considerations that also inform uh, force protection. And also within the uh, G3, J3, uh, where civil reconnaissance, engagements, and influence, targeting, and force protection are housed. Now, I get that this isn't going to be a popular consideration for some. A lot of the old school, school guys that I know will push back on this right away if they haven't already in the last minute. Um, but in this nonlinear competitive environment, civil affairs, you know, we must reassess what works, what has not been working, and what we could do better. Now, let me conclude my proportion with restating that recent literature from the Joint Force is pursuing new methodologies and mechanisms to compete with adversaries and win. That's all we want to do in the Army is win. But information operations is inadequate to address information-related capabilities, let alone influence-related capabilities. So it's within these institutions, it's, it's within this institutional layer that we must be introspective and push for modernization and to develop better doctrine that illuminates civil affairs as the premier force for influence in the regular warfare during the cooperation and competition phases of integrated military campaigns. Shafi, back to you. Thanks, Rob. So I'd just like to close it out here um, with uh, George Cannon. So if we uh, look at, at great power competition, I think a lot of people see it in terms of large scale combat operations. I see it as political warfare. So that, that's the conceptualization we have to use, which makes influence very important to it. So uh, we've kind of tried to spell out a, a logical um, flow for, for a pathway for civil affairs that we wield influence through strategic engagement, which is used to build resilience. And we can train and, and, and validate resilience through exercise that incorporate res, um, resistance at, as part of uh, great power competition. And um, I'll thank you for, uh, having us here, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you, guys. Next, we have Major Zabo in the CIMIC aspect. Yep, sir, do you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay. Mm. 
I'm working on this on the sharing my toads. So uh, please give me some feedback. Do you see uh, the shared screen? Yes, I can. Thank you very much, sir. So uh, good afternoon and good evening uh, for the European side. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. It's a great honor to, to present the issue paper. Uh, as a starter, I would say that this is a co-authored and co-assisted uh, paper. I did it with uh, Master Sergeant Rob Nicholson from the uh, 21st of uh, TCA command here in uh, Europe in Kaiserslautern. He is a seasoned uh, civil affairs uh, NCO and he assisted me. Uh, about myself, uh, my name is Major uh, Choba Sabo uh, from the Hungarian uh, uh, CIMIC unit. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've been uh, working in a CIMIC environment since uh, 16 years now. Right now, I'm working for the CIMIC Center of Excellence in uh, Den Haag, Netherlands. And uh, I am right now the deputy uh, branch chief of the concept interoperability and capability branch. And I will highlight the interoperability because my whole message or with Robert or whole message is all about the interoperability. And uh, uh, because when we uh, received this offer, uh, to, to present something like that, uh, a European a NATO officer and an American uh, civil affairs officer, what, what we can choose as a, as a topic. And uh, it's, a, it's a lucky coincidence, not really a coincidence, but it is a, a reality now that at the CCOE, uh, we have a official synchronization project. Uh, and I will uh, go uh, later on on my slides, uh, what does it mean? So let me jump on to the uh, presentation. Here is the outline of uh, my agenda during this uh, 10 minutes, and I hope I can make it, even though it's, uh, this is a kind of torture to me, having only 10 minutes to speak, but I do my best. So uh, introduction, I, I did it. I don't have uh, uh, legendary uh, pictures right now about what did I uh, do so far. Uh, I'm focusing on the problems, the statement, the problem statement. Uh, what is this paper all about? Uh, after that, I jump on the synchronization project, what we are carry on uh, within the CCOE. And after, at the end, a kind of conclusion, the recommendation on the .mlpf uh, analysis framework and a conclusion of the issue paper. So, uh, so a small thing about the introduction for, for people, uh, maybe our civil affairs or semi colleagues, it, it, it should, should be a little bit weird that uh, two guys, a semi and a civil affairs uh, NCO officer, uh, did uh, a paper together, but this is truly reflecting the reality on the ground. And it, it, it uh, haven't started yesterday. It, it's uh, uh, 10 years now, my first time in Afghanistan in my, in my S9 branch, uh, it was in mine, but I was the deputy. We had an embedded team and it was 2010, 11. So far in the European situation uh, uh, changed after 2014, we, we saw a huge amount of influx of uh, US uh, civil affairs troops all around the Eastern Front. So really, I have a lot of uh, uh, in, uh, very good uh, experience with working with the civil affairs. Uh, you can see one of the, uh, <laughs> the uh, representatives of the civil affairs, Larry, uh, thanks for the kind words. Uh, it always welcome uh, from my side. Okay. So uh, what is the problem here? So uh, as we see, we have two capability within the NATO as a whole, and uh, both of them operating on the same domain, the human domain, at least we claim it, uh, that we are operating on it. This is uh, according to our doctrines or TTPs uh, and so on and so on. So we are the designated SMEs of these, these domains because nobody else uh, uh, dealing with, with it, even though 
everybody is operating in this domain, but we are the SMEs of the human domain. We are the one who are engaging and interact uh, liaise with the uh, civil actors, the non-military actors, uh, the population, and so on and so on. But still, we have these two capabilities, which has no institutionalized contacting point. Uh, the doctrines on a doctrine level or governing doctrines are not really uh, cross-referencing each other. Even though on the ground we are working, and uh, as I said before, it's, it hasn't started yesterday, but, but still something is missing. And, and here is a gap, uh, we would like to bridge it with this visionary article. I'm a kind of optimistic guy, but realistic as well. So I know it's a, it's a, it's a far-fetched vision, but it's an article, it's a paper, so uh, uh, I can afford it uh, right now. So we are focusing on the bridging the gap. Why? Because we would like to facilitate and, and enhance the level of interoperability of a civil affairs and the CIMIC, NATO CIMIC, European CIMIC, if you like, if you name it. Uh, because uh, there are a lot of opportunity here. Uh, we have, of course, a lot of differences, but I would say if we make a, a list, we have more similarities. You see the picture on the, on the, on the right corner. Uh, uh, this is when we did it with Rob Nicholson together, a presentation for civil affairs troops in, uh, in uh, Grafenberg, Germany, uh, last year on our first uh, NATO fam CIMIC familiarization course. So we started from a very bottom-up approach, uh, and you will see it, why? Because influencing such a, such a let's say, a, a project, uh, you have to start somewhere, but you need champions on a very high level. Uh, but I will uh, get to this point later on. So this is, this is the problem we have, uh, if not a problem, but it's, it's the reality. And uh, in the CCOE, uh, in 2018, uh, launched a project, or branch launched it, by the way. Uh, as I said, the interoperability, that's our, one of our main uh, domain. Therefore, we see, we saw uh, that we can jump on it and we can grab this opportunity. And, and we are following three lines, main, main effort uh, here within this project. Uh, in order to enhance the cooperation and promote the interoperability between civil affairs and uh, NATO CIMIC. Uh, we are following the concept development lines of effort. Uh, as I said before, our doctrines are not really cross-referencing each other. Uh, I check it. Even though on the lower level, uh, which is not doctrine, like the CCOE have a CIMIC handbook, there is a huge portion uh, of civil affairs, thanks to the uh, 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 SWIX uh, colleagues who provided 25 page, uh, huge, huge uh, contribution to that. But that's a CCOE product. It's not an official NATO document. So that part is missing. Uh, training and education, I consider this is our, our most, uh, let's say, uh, uh, successful lines of effort because we already did it on the ground. Uh, with our civil affairs uh, colleagues. Uh, we organize a civil, uh, dedicated course for civil affairs person in order to get acquainted much better with the NATO CIMIC, especially the uh, 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 civil affairs colleagues who are operating in Europe and in Africa, because yes, in Africa, some of the countries uh, taking over uh, uh, NATO CIMIC, uh, it's a French influence, of course, uh, we can say it, but there are a lot of connecting points. Uh, in academia line of effort, uh, we, we have, and I saw it in the audience uh, the, from the Smithsonian Institute, uh, uh, Corinne, uh, if I can say that, uh, we are working on the uh, uh, Amer American Monument Officer training. Uh, we have a, a student on it and we will provide a presenter about the NATO CIMIC uh, cultural property protection line of effort. There is a lot of room uh, to expand this uh, academia line of effort. Uh, next year we are uh, planning to have uh, a CCOE uh, publish a booklet which, which dealing with the interoperability where we are dedicated a huge part of the uh, uh, civil affairs uh, academia background. But uh, back to my presentation, and this is my last uh, 
almost the last slide. Here are the recommendations, what we, what we uh, offer. I should have started with that, that this won't be a, a, a lecture about the hybrid warfare. There are a lot of definition, overwhelming uh, li uh, literature about it. Uh, I don't want to jump into that uh, hole. Uh, we are providing a synchronized civil uh, military capability, at least on the paper, of course in order to be more interoperable, uh, uh, more uh, uh, being more interoperable on the, uh, on the civil military environment. Uh, let's put it this way. In a doctrine, as I said before, uh, if there is a recommendation, the, uh, the, the doctrines can be aligned or adjusted a little bit closer to each other because right now, basically, this is not the case. In organization, uh, main drivers, of course, CCOE uh, as a, as a, uh, a seven nation uh, sponsored center of excellence within the NATO with a huge freedom of maneuver because it's uh, not the NATO is telling us what we do, but we are working for the NATO, of course, but we're sponsoring nation uh, paying the bill at the end of the day. And I guess this is matters a little bit uh, more in this case but we are fully dedicated to the NATO, of course. And then from the US part, of course, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a natural choice. The, uh, the SWIX, uh, where the trainings uh, and education ongoing. And, and what we uh, offer here, that our course is already existing. Uh, this can be easily uh, utilized in uh, both side of the Atlantic Ocean here in the uh, Netherlands, in the CCOE and, and, and in the uh, US uh, side as well, uh, somehow integrate into the training cycle, at least uh, to get familiarized and more acquainted with each other uh, uh, line of work, uh, each other uh, doctrines, TTPs and so on and so on. Uh, it's a, as I said, this is our uh, uh, very uh, successful line of effort because next year, uh, if the coronavirus uh, do not kill it again, uh, we will go uh, to the United States and having uh, the uh, Quantico and the Marine Corps and the Civil Military uh, Operation School uh, doing a familiarization course uh, for two, two, two plus one day and the same in Staten Island, uh, the KCOM uh, 3352. Uh, that's planned. Uh, Leadership-wise, our CCOE director is uh, totally dedicated for the plan. Uh, uh, we, we tried and we uh, planned uh, key leader engagements with the civil affairs stakeholders in the United States, but again, the, uh, in April, the coronavirus killed that. But uh, uh, we would like to reactivate this, uh, this uh, line. Again, that's for sure. And policy, uh, CCO is working on it to having official champion from the SHAPE or NATO side, uh, uh, focusing on that this is uh, falling to the basket of the BACO, the, uh, to the interoperability domain. And, and from the US side, yes, uh, that's not my cup of tea, but uh, of course, uh, we don't have right now US uh, side champion. Uh, to promote this idea. And my last slide is the conclusion that uh, if we have such a synchronized uh, civil military capability uh, uh, using a collaborative approach, uh, we would be, I would say, more effective in countering any kind of challenges, not any kind, but definitely a lot of challenges, which is coming from the uh, hybrid warfare and the hybrid warfare impulse threats, especially in the civil environment, because we are the one who are operating on this environment, at least we claim it. So uh, this is, I guess, uh, I didn't give you the, uh, the ultimate solution here, how we counter these, uh, uh, let's say, threats. But I guess if we are using our capability much more uh, synchronized way, uh, exploiting the synergies, what we have, and focus on the similarities, then we, we would have an asset which, which will be more capable on the ground. A synchronization, that's easy, inter interoperability. And if we have such an asset, uh, again, this is uh, theoretical right now, these assets can do it in a frame 
to reckon, assess, prepare the civil environment even before the actual operation start and the phase zero phase, which from the CIMIC side, it's not really used, but from the civil affairs side, you are working on it very hard. Uh, but uh, can you imagine a, 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 a combined, uh, combined uh, asset would be more effective, that's for sure. Uh, engaging with the non-military actors, using the semikers uh, on the ground because they have uh, uh, extended the uh, semic liaison matrix than the civil affairs guys and sharing with each other, uh, coordinating the, the line of effort. Uh, and after we can provide more comprehensive civil environment picture, which can be used in the semic planning, oh, sorry, in the planning phase. And this is all about that being more relevant uh, within the command structure as well because uh, that's for sure within the NATO uh, there is a huge gap about the force and command structure uh, knowledge about the civil affairs and and this uh, uh, to be honest it's a two-way street uh, but but this kind of synchronization project uh, can promote and uh, provide, uh, bridge the gap between these two uh, uh, capabilities. And I guess this is a, a right momentum because we have the security environment shifted uh, in, in Europe in a, in a very uh, bad way, especially in the eastern uh, flank, we can say that, to we have the momentum to promote this, uh, this project or this uh, point paper. So uh, that was my last slide and here, uh, I can refer to the quote to uh, Winston Churchill, uh, which I, I like it very much. Uh, I mean, not Mr. Churchill, but his quoting uh, is, I guess it's uh, applied for this situation very well. Uh, thank you for your attention, depending on your question or later on the question, I'm ready to uh, answer it. And sir, uh, General, uh, your question, I read, really did not get it, uh, your, your question, but at that time when you were in Germany and Netherlands, I was a happy secondary school boy playing soccer very well and not really uh, having the mindset uh, about the CIMIC, but in the audience there are more seasoned CIMICer who can answer that. Thank you very much. Back to you, sir. Thank you, Major Zabo, and I appreciate your reference to my extensive age. Uh, <laughs> I'm Sorry, that out. was not my intent. I'm going to start out with a, a softball question for each of the presenters. Um, a couple of times we've heard that influencers are not necessarily the same as leaders. And I also commented that each of your presentations is at a more granular level than we're used to hearing in earlier years where the, we were at a more theoretic level. Here's my question. If you could have an office call with one person or one office agency who you would like to recruit as your godfather in advancing the causes and the concepts that are in your papers, with whom would that office call be? So let's take it in the same order and start at the top with uh, Major Haviland or Captain Haviland. I think the, I guess the easy answer for us, you know, what we're proposing is essentially a, a Marine Corps manpower solution. So, you know, the, the comment on the Marine Corps would be the, the easy question. I think he could implement what we're proposing uh, immediately and unilaterally, but um, I guess a, a more nuanced answer um, to really kind of get to the bottom of what we're proposing kind of functionally rather than just administratively. Um, you know, we're talking about access to embassies, we're talking about interagency and multilateral cooperation. I think we would have to probably have an audience with, you know, perhaps the Secretary of State or the, you know, the head of the regional bureau for whatever kind of region we're operating in, but um, certainly somebody in the interagency, likely the State Department, but I'll, I think the, uh, the two majors get paid more, so maybe they have a better answer. Yeah, that's major. I, I would agree. The, the Department of State is really probably the the big plug for us in being able to get uh, our implementation into the embassies um, 
as well as the Commandant, probably the Department of Navy as well, uh, being able to get that leg in. Um, so yeah, it, it would definitely be the Department of State. Okay. Sergeant Lloyd, yours might be a little easier. I, I hate to make it a hat trick, but I, I would say the same thing. You know, but I'm looking at it from my perspective of, um, you know, in the near future, I, if all things hold true, I will be on the civil affairs planning team for you, sir. And I think my, I've already asked this question internally a couple of times, what's our relationship with the, the Bureau of European Affairs for Department of State and their input as far as, you know, Annex K goes and developing the civil affairs, civil military operations plan for Europe. And, and I think maybe even more specifically to that, although I frankly don't know who the person would be, who is the, who is the liaison between DOD and Department of State that helps manage the strategic planning for defense attaché's office. Cause that's really one of the key nodes. I think between that node and then the Paul Mill officers, again, in my experience in Bulgaria, well, frankly, Uganda and Bulgaria and Hungary, having the CA team connected to the defense attaché, connected to the Paul Mill officer and be able to synchronize engagement and, and civil reconnaissance to the three of us was really a game changer for us. So, you know, now that I'm trying to take more of a look across the whole GCC, I would be interested in what level of those discussions are happening at a higher level. Thank you. Colonel Parzak, what door would you knock on? Or, my, or Major Swill? Sure, I'll jump on that one. So uh, if I could knock on one door, it would be Lieutenant General Rainey down at the Combined Arms Center. Um, I have, have, you know, have working with, worked with the Cyber Center of Excellence. Um, they were the ones in, in charge of writing the Army's information concept that was recently uh, put on strategic pause as we understand and we look further into terminology such as information advantage and what that means. But I think a lot of the, I think a lot of civil affairs future and our capability development and the codifying of our lessons over the last 20 years uh, resides at the Combined Arms Center. And I think Lieutenant General Rainey has a, a large, um, a large uh, piece to play in that. So if I could influence one person, you know, you have to know your target audience. Um, he would be the one for, the one person that I would, uh, I'd, whose door I would knock on, sir. Got it. Thank you. Shafi? Uh, yes, sir. I guess on my la last side, I already mentioned the, uh, the, the shape. Uh, yeah. And the uh, U.S. US uh, Army <laughs> General, uh, or maybe in the European U.S. Uh, would be fine just just to start with, I'm not shooting so high. Thank you. Shafi, I'm not used to seeing you with a beard in city, so <laughs> go ahead. Actually, we'll let Rob take that one. All right, hey, I'm actually glad that uh, I was thrilled with uh, Major Schwilly's response because as, as many of you guys know, I work for the Center for Army Lessons Learn and I'm, I, I, I engage with the Combined Arms Center every day. And as, a, and as a doctrinal focus guy, I know General Rainey is going to say, hey, how does this problem set? I have six bins in front of me, and they just happen to co-align with an Army function. How is, how, is that civil, how, how is that problem? Which bin does that fit into? And so if I had to have an influence on say, hey, if, I, if we need to modernize CA, he would be the guy that I would want you know, to affect the strategic uh, levels. He, he would be my guy he, he, all day long. I think we're running close to time. I'm going to thank you all for your participation. Wonderful jobs. Look forward to seeing your final papers. So don't don't drop, don't lose interest too soon. But we want to get you into into publication. And Chris, uh, you ready for our next speaker? And you're on mute. Yes, I am. I I am, and I understand, and I think we have. Uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Stability and Humanitarian Affairs, uh, Stephanie Hammond on the line. Uh, so if you can bring her up and let her take the floor, uh, man, it's, it's a great pleasure and honor to have you here. And we look forward to uh, your comments. Well, thank you so much, Chris. And um, I 
received a readout from my team of just uh, the impressive discussion that happened these past few days. And um, thank you for inviting me to uh, just say a few remarks here. And um, thanks to the civil affairs community for putting um, on this symposium. And I know it takes a great deal of time um, to put together a discussion like this. And um, it looks like there's a lot of great information shared. Um, and I look forward to uh, discussing um, how our office here within SOLEC Stability and Humanitarian Affairs can further help advance um, some of the discussion and action items. Um, so my role here in uh, ASD SOLEC, we sit in OSD policy, and then I run the Stability and Humanitarian Affairs DASD ship. Um, and civil affairs plays um, such an important and strategic role across the combatant commands. And um, it's really a pleasure um, being here in OSD policy because we uh, certainly take this to heart on the uh, civilian side over an OSD policy and are very grateful for the team that we have in-house uh, working the civil affairs portfolio. Um, and then, too, uh, our office is also leading the international COVID-19 response. And um, COVID-19 um, has certainly brought more attention to the um, important work that civil affairs is doing and will continue to do um, to come combat this global pandemic uh, that we're facing. DOD right now um, has been very much in a leadership role along with the interagency, especially state and USAID on assisting allies and partners. So we've delivered $100 million um, worth of assistance and counting to about 135 key allies and partners globally. Um, and then we're preparing, too, for the second and third waves of um, the COVID response and then how we can work on some of that longer-term, more capacity uh, building uh, programs. Um, so here within SOLEC, we're um, continuing to advance civil affairs within the department and how it complements the national defense strategy, particularly the irregular warfare annex. So while the NDS established that DOD will assume some risk by not shaping the joint force for long-term uh, large-scale stabilization operations, um, stabilizing a region or state with direct bearing on U.S. Um, national interests remains a wartime mission, as uh, this was stated in the NDS, and stabilization remains one of three, along with offensive and defensive operations, as identified in Joint Publication 3-0 Joint Operations. The Stabilization Review, or the SAR, um, and DOD Directive 3000.05 continue to guide our stabilization policy and it emphasizes a small DOD pr footprint, working, of course, by, with, and through local, legitimate, indigenous partners and the work of our civil affairs teams um, in Northeast Syria and the work that we continually do um, in Syria during the defeat ISIS campaign um, underscores the strong impact of this uh, civil affairs work on the ground. Um, we also greatly appreciate the uh, work the civil affairs um, and the civil military support elements and um, our teams are doing across the geographic combatant commands. Both soft and general purpose for civil affairs are doing a lot to help stabilize many regions right now. Um, I also wanted to briefly touch on two other issues um, that we're working on uh, quite closely with uh, the civil affairs community. One of them is uh, here in Stability and Humanitarian Affairs, we're leading um, DOD's cultural heritage protection efforts. And I deeply appreciate all the hard work um, the civil affairs community is doing on that front as we establish the CHP network, work on the ongoing white paper, and explore best um, practices to gather data about CHP across 
the department. Um, also, I would be remiss to not mention your ongoing work with women, peace, and security efforts across DOD. So this has been a very significant line of effort within the department, and this is another issue um, my team manages, and civil affairs um, uh, insights on WPS have been very invaluable um, to us, particularly now as Secretary Esper signed the WPS implementation plan back in June, and now we're moving um, forward on that implementation and that um, four-year strategy that we have within the department. So have a very robust ongoing um, process on WPS. Thank you again, um, Chris and team, for this opportunity to join you this afternoon. And then I look forward to ongoing uh, discussions. Over. Thank you so much, um, and that, that was very helpful. And uh, it was a great update. We, we often uh, like to hear what uh, what's happening in, in the Pentagon, and uh, we would certainly look forward to a much uh, more granular discussion with your office. Uh, this coming spring, when we are in the D.C. area and have our civil affairs roundtable. Uh, uh, Wonderful, Chris. I look yeah. forward to that discussion this spring. We, we'd love to have you come. Uh, we would really look forward to it. So thanks for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to uh, give us an update. That was really very helpful. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so if I may, um, I'm going to just kind of make a public service announcement. For those of you who haven't figured it out yet, if you click on the polls icon at the bottom of the screen, the box will appear, uh, and you can choose one, and only one, of the papers for your vote as the best paper. And uh, so while you're doing that, uh, I've got a question here from uh, Dennis Cahill, who uh, many of you know uh, is... Um, the Capabilities Manager at Fort, at Fort Bragg, uh, and it's an interesting one. He's, uh, he, like myself, he's heard the term engagement used a lot um, when folks are describing either activities or capabilities. Uh, this morning, for example, uh, General Hugh Van Rusen talked a lot about how the UN is sort of migrating more from this term FIMIC uh, to the term engagement. Uh, now actually require each and every infantry battalion in UN peace operation um, to have an engagement for them, which, by the way, must be uh, uh, female personnel. So uh, that, that's an interesting uh, point that he's making. Do you think we should use the term more in describing CAO, uh, particularly as CAO applies to irregular warfare as uh, mentioned, uh, and many of the topics that you discussed. We also uh, talked about it a lot in the, in the paper that we just responded about. I uh, referenced in the chat. So um, I'll open the floor to the uh, paper presenters on uh, on that question. Use the word engagement more maybe as, as a bridging concept across all of the different Yes, sir, they were all uh, switched over to attendees so they can all vote. Ah, okay. Gotcha. Okay, so then um, the, the, then I'll just add one more comment and we'll just leave it for uh, food for thought and uh, anybody who's got any comments on it, uh, please deliver them to uh, Dennis Cahill. Um, just a bit of history that in, uh, uh, back in I think 2018 or 2017, the Army actually identified engagement as one of its war fighting functions and safety practices. And uh, the argument we make in the AORC paper um, is that what, you know, why don't they just go back to that because it seems to be the one that, that um, kind of covers everything, not just influence information, fiber, all that sort of thing. Largely considered. All right, fill up that space. Um, going once, going twice. Uh, if you have not voted, please do it immediately. And uh, when you're ready, let's, uh, let's bring up the results. 
about a 30 second warning order on finishing your voting. Okay. And Chris, I don't think you or I see the results, so we may have to rely on. No, Arnell. I cannot vote because I'm a host or a panelist. I'm so, <laughs> so Arnell might have to be our honest broker. That might be an oxymoron. I don't know, but uh, well, <laughs> well yeah, I'm so. not a broker. I, well, anyway, I will do it. Once, uh, once we end the poll, I think it'll show to everybody, gentlemen. Okay, it looks like we have about you know. 80 to 85 percent already voted, so I think lots of people are on their phones might not be able to vote, but uh, we're probably probably close out. Right, a few more seconds, and then we'll. Well, 85% voter turnout would be, would be pretty good. <laughs> wow. Okay. Looks like Colonel Sidudden and Mr. Schaefer. There it is. Boy, all the winners. I just love this technology. Um, so we have, um, yeah, we have Colonel Sidudden and, um, and his paper. And Colonel Bingham, how are you reading it? Who would take second place? It's a second place Lloyd. the gap. So it's a Master Sergeant Lloyd on civil military relations. And third place will be the final presentation by Colonel Z by Major Zabo. Okay. Well, look, all of the presentations were excellent and, and all the papers are excellent. And when you finally read them, uh, and they, by the way, they will, 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 the only thing you'll be able to look at uh, between now and then are the some paper summaries. I know we get a lot of calls from people. Can I see the paper? Can I see the paper? No, you can't before it's published because uh, that's to put the, to the authors the, the last possible opportunity for any last minute updates if something comes out late and breaking. Um, but to protect the integrity of the, pro pro uh, the process, we don't uh, share the papers with anyone except members of the committee uh, until the papers are actually published. And they will be published uh, usually around the 1st of March. Uh, the Association of the U.S. Army published the papers then uh, and included in that by the way, will be the uh, symposium report. There'll be a, a short report in, the, in a couple of weeks or so uh, to uh, kind of sum up the uh, symposium. Uh, then sometime in December, we'll have the uh, symposium report, the full symposium report out late November, early December. Uh, and then uh, again, first of March. And then just going a little further forward in the uh, calendar of events, uh, major milestones. Uh, we are looking to have our civil affairs roundtable to close out our sort of annual cycle of learning. Uh, and we'll focus on uh, looking at all of the uh, insights and observations and see what focused policy recommendations. This is where, why we always try to have the roundtable in the Washington, D.C. area uh, so that we can have that community of practice to the community of policy uh, uh, some of those uh, major recommendations that have percolated up, which ones they should be most focused on uh, from the viewpoint of the, the extended civil affairs corps and its partners and friends. Um, that will probably be in the April time frame. We'll find out from the uh, U.S. Army Peacekeeping and Stability Operations uh, Institute um, in Carlisle at the, at the Army War College. Um, they have an, a, a now biannual event instead of every year, but it's biannual now called the Peace and Stability Operations Training and Education Workshop. We're going to coincide with that so that people can uh, get on a TDY ticket a little easier to go see both events. 
rather than just for a single name. Um, so just watch this space. And again, uh, if you uh, are not signed up on the Civil Affairs Association website to uh, get updates uh, to your email, uh, you should do so. You should also uh, join our social media websites. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on LinkedIn, we're on uh, Instagram, we're on YouTube, um, and I don't know if I forgot one. I think I did. But anyway, uh, go there. And please consider joining the association uh, for the price of a couple of lattes. You get a hell of a lot of bang for your buck every year. So, um, so, so consider that. You know, we're always looking for new talent, by the way, in the, in the association, on the uh, governance side of the association. Uh, we've got a youth movement going on, not just in, in how we're looking at things, but uh, in the leadership as well. So please consider all those things. Uh, we certainly have a lot to do, and uh, we can always use a couple more pillars on the wheel. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, General Thingham and then to uh, President Curlin for his final meeting. Uh, my only comments are profound thanks to Arnell, who's probably on his second pint over in the UK, and to Chris and their support staffs for a terrific three days of presentations. Uh, they've been amazingly uh, filled with good input and overcoming the technological challenges of doing this via Zoom. I think they deserve even extra credit. And I want to give them my thanks and, and appreciation. Uh, Joe, you ready to go? Ready to go, Bruce. Thanks very much. Well, it's uh, been quite a, a three-day event, uh, starting on Monday through today. Uh, it's just been fantastic. Uh, our speakers did a great job. I think our people who put this together also did a wonderful job in, in their presentations. Give you a little bit of background. Uh, just the importance of continuity and the civil affairs evolution. I think we're back to the future and the importance of continuity. Uh, to give you some of my introduction in civil affairs, I actually began in 1948 uh, by being born in the civil affairs. Since my dad was a, a member of the occupation of the army of Japan doing civil affairs actions as an infantry captain. And he worked in post hostility operations to stabilize that com uh, country. He joined civil affairs in 1948 as a member of the 304th and became a member of the Civil Affairs Association in the same year. He served 25 years as civil affairs officers and retired as commander of the 304th in 1973. I may be the only such officer today with this type of background. In 1973, while on active duty as a second lieutenant, I had the opportunity of being controller during the logistical ex exercise, which involved civil affairs and the entire 304th CA Brigade, then a group at the time. And in 1974, I became a member of the 304th and, and joined the association. I've worked in hum the human environment in the 1980s, today's called human domain, in operations which had strategic implications, the C Cuban uh, burial boat lift at Eglin Air Force Base, and then opening Indian Town Gap with the, as detachment commander of the 304th. In 1983, this continued with the Grenadians during Operation Urgent Fury. And while assigned to the first SOCOM, they had four additional ODT missions from 1984 to 1990, working with the Charge affairs in Barbados. Finally, the Haitian migration operation in Cuba in 1992, which provided stability to the, the region in 93 and 94 as liaison officer to the uh, U.S. Army War College, PKSOI, the Canadian Peacekeeping Institute, and the UN, which continues today. When we started this uh, CA journey in 2012, my goal was to invigorate reinvigorate the CAA and we identified three areas to educate, to advocate, and to motivate by bringing value to the community. community. To educate, we introduced the education platform that we have today through our symposiums in the fall and roundtables in the spring. And with our publication of our issue papers, we get out the information on current trends 
and we export it to the world. Our ongoing CA uh, podcasts have continued in between the meetings and also has served as a valuable resource to our military and, and to our partners. In essence, we have served as the RAND for civil affairs, which we will continue to do. The second area of emphasis has been advocacy. Early in my CA career, I had the opportunity of working with and meeting three great supporters and advocates for civil affairs in the early 1980s. Major General Bill Berkman, Chief of the Army Reserve, former commander of the 351st KCOM, Major, Joe, Major General Joe Lutz, former commander of the Special Warfare Center and 1st Special Operations Command, and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General John Vesey, who helped save the branch and that provided us with the stability for the branch today. In the 1990s, it was General Jack Sheehan, U.S. Marine Corps, JCS, General George Jowan, Commander NATO, and General Wayne Downing, U.S. SOCOM. Since the mid-2000s, mid has been former US, USAR Commander, Lieutenant General Jeff Talley, and General Carter Ham, former AFRICOM Commander. Today, we will continue to engage active and retired military leaders to strengthen and grow civil affairs. Over the last 40 years, we have been the most engaged branch in the military and in involvement in operations. And as Lieutenant General Hooper mentioned, as what is known today, persistent engagement during the old conflict spectrum to the current competition conflict and competition phases. Now, as has been discussed in the panels, the need for a strong doctrinal strategic CA force is a mandatory training requirement. We will continue to support the evolution of the civil affairs branch and our movement in the accessions branch sooner rather than later will take place. A strong civil affairs school and university, which will educate not only the civil affairs force, army and marine leaders and units, but also our allied brothers and sisters. This association will continue by advocacy with the State Department, Department of Defense, aid, NGOs, and private businesses, and with our international partners to join in accomplishing these goals. Finally, we will continue to motivate people and organizations to join us in this journey as a value-added leadership organization with value-added initiatives and programs. By our CAA continued engagement, we can avoid recreating the wheel and by using all organizations mentioned to do this and help and to enable them to win in their missions where we can win in our mission and area responsibility. Finally, thanks go out to our wonderful panel contributors, our supporting sponsors, those who joined us as participants and our CAA leadership and their teams who made this great event possible. The leaders are Eastern Vice President Colonel Carolyn Pogge, Southern Vice President Lieutenant Colonel Arnold David, Southwest Vice President Colonel Chris Holshek, retired, Midwest Vice President Major General Daniel Ammerman, retired, Western Vice President BG Chris Stockel, retired, and enlisted Vice President Command Sergeant Major Tim Coring, retired. They will be engaging you in the future so that you can come and grow with us. Secure the victory so that by our collaboration as organizations, we can also seal the pace. Thanks again for all you do. Stay healthy and well, and good night.